Carmine's not even giving his presentation. I'm afraid he's going to leave, so we better we better let him get his presentation. <laughs> All right. So you can see the kingship there. You've got Jupiter, the king planet, Regulus, the king star, and the lion. Dissing on everybody today, man. You got you got me and my my good bud Hank. And now the flaming sword. Super swell, super swell, Joe. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty well, Darren. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. We're going to forego for one episode here our study in Colossians because we have Carmine Hetrick back with us. Carmine, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm good, guys. Good to be back. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming back. Hey, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we, we I love figure- working with you guys. Yeah, we figured the longer we let him, we've had to get him back or he wouldn't come back. <laughs> That's right. So, Carmine, we, we actually introduced this a little while back, and I, I, I know I've mentioned it in our podcast, but it's getting real close to Christmas, and you're going to be mm-hmm. talking to us about the Star of Bethlehem. And let me just say for the audience that what Carmine's going to be presenting is just one plausible theory. There's a lot of theories out there. Carmine likes this one, thinks it's a good one. He's going to present a case for it today, but no one knows for sure what the star was. So this ought to be interesting. Hey, hey, Darren, just just because I can and it's fun, I got to push back just a second there because you said no one knows, but God does. Oh. <laughs> All right, you. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to let you have that one. All right. That's the only debate you'll win against me. But hey. <laughs> I'll take it. I've got God on my side oh, on that one. So. Man. Yeah, you do. You do. So because Carmine has a lot to give us today, Joe, we're going to forego your joke. But to be honest, after, the last, after the last couple of weeks, I think we should forego your joke. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. No love here. Well, we'll let you kind of, we'll let you get some better material. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> hiatus, oh. Finally, a good executive decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, go. All yeah. right, I've, I won't beat up on him anymore. But Joe, you are going to read for us, since we are talking about the Star of Bethlehem, we can find that story in Matthew chapter 2, and you're going to read for us verses 1 through 11, talking about that, and then we'll get to Carmine, and we'll get this thing rolling. Perfect. And I'm going to read from the the NIV today. So if anybody happens to be following along, it's a good readable version of this story. So again, this is Matthew 2 verses 1 through 11. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All righty. Joe, you're pretty good at that. I think we should do a Bible version with you reading it. <laughs> well, I think you need to put a little nice Christmas music in the background. And, yeah, you I, know. Can edit, I can edit it in. And, and, all right. So that was good. So Carmine, that, that sort of set the stage talking about the star. So when you're ready to roll, oh, I'll tell you what, Carmine, because you know me, I'll forget it. Why don't you give everyone your website, the name of your website, and anything else that where we can find you, and I'll also put that in our, our uh, show notes. Okay, Joel, or Darren. I'm <laughs> oh, here we go! <laughs> <laughs> no, you, can te- you can tell me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, the, the title of my website is Daniel Reloaded, and uh, uh, the link to that will be in the description there, as you said. All righty. Your job today is to convince Joe and I that your theory <laughs> on the star is correct. <laughs> right, and right, the audience, right. Well, I hope, 
<laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Well, fortunately, I have a little help because it's not just my theory. There are actually quite a few people that, that see some significance to this. But real quick, I wanted to mention that it, it's interesting that we're talking about this right now because this really loosely ties into the episode that we did when we were talking about Matthew 24 last time I was on the show. I actually learned about what I'm going to be presenting here when I read David Chilton's book, The Days of Vengeance, his commentary on the book of Revelation. And the book of Re- Revelation actually parallels Matthew 24 quite a bit, which is what we we're talking about last time. Chilton covered the Star of Bethlehem, as I'm going to present it today, in chapters 11 through 12, where he covered a revelation there. So now, as Joel read there in Matthew 2, it records that this star, okay, was some sort of indicator to the Magi that the Jewish Messiah had been born, and it actually led them to him. And people have long speculated about what this star actually was. Was it provided supernaturally by God? Was it, does it have a, some sort of a naturalistic explanation, uh, like a shooting star, a comet, maybe a supernova, even planetary conjunctions? And it's, it's really interesting that the German astronomer Johannes Kepler, who discovered and formalized the planet planetary laws of motion back in the 1600s, he actually favored the idea of planetary conjunctions. And he was really interested in this idea of the the star of Bethlehem. And he did his own research on that. Now, uh, we're not going to cover his theory today, but there are other people who followed in line with him. And one of those was Dr. Ernest L. Martin, uh, who wrote several books on this. Now, his work is pretty involved. I'm not going to talk directly about him, but he was the originator of this, as far as I can tell. We're going to take a look at another presentation of this, and that is a documentary that was created in 2007 by Rick Larson. Rick Larson is a lawyer, and he became interested in the Star of Bethlehem based on a publication he had seen written by Craig Chester. And Craig Chester's articles that influenced him were actually based on Dr. Martin's work. And long story short, Larson took an interest in this. And he was actually able to confirm Dr. Martin's theory for himself using desktop astronomical software. And like I said, he published a documentary on that in 2007 titled The Star of Bethlehem. So listeners new to this subject, I think you really enjoy his commentary, although he's not the originator. He does a very good job of helping you visualize what exactly he's talking about. And it's a very short documentary. It's only about 40 minutes long. You can check that out uh, for yourself. You're going to be specifically talking to us about Larson's points. You're going to give us several points. Is that what you're going to present today? That's correct. That's correct. Yep. Okay. So before you get to those points, the the thing that pops in my head right away that that I have to ask is when you start talking about stars and stars aligning and all these different theories, how does this relate to astrology? Because of course, as Christians, we don't want nothing to do with astrology. So what's the difference there? And how is this not astrology if it's not? Sure. Well, this is a common pushback. Okay. So it's fair that you bring this up. Now, Lars, Larson addresses this in his video. Martin addresses this as well in his book. Uh, They all say no, and I think I tend to agree with them. Astrology is the belief that celestial bodies have power over the universe and one's life, sort of like little gods, you know? And that isn't what we're going to be talking about today. This isn't the the understanding of the star, uh, this understanding of the star of Bethlehem is. To use the words of Hank Hanegraaff, all the star really did was forth tell the arrival of the Son of God. It wasn't like it was something that we were looking at saying that the stars you were somehow like originator of the Messiah or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, we're we're not using Hank Hanegraaff anymore. (laughs) 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 Just kidding. He's still got some good stuff that Darren's dissing on everybody today, man. He got he got me and my my good bud Hank and (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The audience probably already knows this because we've discussed it, but Hank Hanegraaff is Eastern Orthodox now, and that's that's a whole other another subject. But no, I, I'm sure he's right on that. And yeah, thanks for answering that question because I'm sure people are concerned. I think that's one of the red flags that pop up. I don't want to get into anything that, that uh, has to do with astrology, and it sounds like it doesn't. I know uh, for me, when I hear the term... That was, that was I, for I, Carmine. I, yeah, well, this is... <laughs> Carmine, let's let's maybe you and I need to agree to kick, kick Darren off of his own show here. All right. I was just thinking, I kind of like words and just the way they sound. I'm a musician, so maybe that's part of it. But I just love the term planetary conjunction. That that right there is worth the podcast for me. When I heard that, I couldn't help but hear. I think it's Schoolhouse Rock. Conjunction, junction. What's your function? And I was trying to tie this into the the cosmic flaming sword podcast. I'm having a great oh, time man. already, guys. <laughs> 
All right. Yo, Carmine's not even giving his presentation. I'm afraid he's going to leave, so we better we better let him give his presentation. Uh, all right. We, we, we will. All right, Carmine. You mentioned nine points, but I think you're going to discuss – you said that uh, beforehand we were talking about this, there's three key points that we want to focus on, and then there's six other points. So when you're ready to roll, let her roll. Okay. So I thought what we could do is I'll just give a – I'll just run down through the nine points very quickly, just what points he made, and then I'll just elaborate on the three most significant ones. So, you know, Larson's nine characteristics of the star. One, it's associated with exact timing. Two, the star endured over a significant span of time. Three, it rose in the east, indicating some sort of celestial body. Four, it was something seemingly insignificant, but once noticed, its significance became very apparent. Five, it suggested the Jewish nation. Six, it suggested kingship. Seven, it suggested birth. Eight, it went ahead of them as they left Jerusalem, the Magi, that is. And nine, the star stopped over the place where the child was, which was Bethlehem. So those are the nine points. There are three of them that I think are probably the most compelling and maybe the most difficult to, to understand. Those are points six, seven, and nine. Sounds great, Carmine. Okay, for the three points that require the most explanation, let's start at point six. Now, this was the one that suggested kingship. Now, it's interesting that around the time of King Herod's death, or at least the time that Rick Larson thinks Herod died, there's a whole backstory to that, but he thinks that Herod died around 3 BC. Okay, and I think he makes a very good case for that. Now, around that time, just so happens that the king planet, Jupiter, was underscoring the king star, Regulus in the constellation Leo, which is the lion, and he was underscoring it with a what's called a triple conjunction, where Jupiter was passing by Regulus three different times in, in the night sky over a short span of time around Herod's death. Now, so you can see the kingship there. You've got Jupiter, the king planet, Regulus, the king star, and the lion. And this also ties in with the, the point about Judah. The, the Messiah was to come from the tribe of Judah, and it's apparent that mm. the symbol for the tribe of Judah was a lion. So these three indications of the king suggested that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, had been born. Now, would this have anything to do, Carmine, with... Uh, any relationship, and I know we haven't got time to go into it, but with the whole gospel of the stars theory? Well, it, it could, and I'm sure that there have been people who've tied tied it into that. I think if you are if you subscribe to that, then I think that lends credibility to, to, to this idea as well. Yeah, that, that would be something I would just, we'll just leave it there, but for everyone that they want to look that up and just look at some of the theories on that of just how much that we already said that this is not astrology, but how much maybe the stars did play into the ancient Near East, including biblical characters. Right, right. Now, related to this idea of, of kingship, is there's also an interesting event that happened on basically the start of Jewish New Year or the Feast of Trumpets. We would know it as Rosh Hashanah around that same time on September 11th and 3 BC. It actually is a depiction of what was happening in Revelation 12, which is why I brought Chilton up earlier. That's why he was covering this because he was describing what was going on in Revelation 12. And Revelation 12 says, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Now, skipping ahead just a couple of verses due to our time constraints here. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God into his throne. Now, I, this seems like this is a picture of the birth of Jesus. And it just so happens that on Rosh Hashanah, on September 11th and 3 BC, there was an event that very closely paralleled this at the very start of that day. And that was the constellation Virgo was coming over the horizon. And the constellation Virgo has a crown of 12 stars. She had the new moon under her feet and the sun was right in the portion of that constellation that would be considered the belly and the chest area. So again, this is right at the start of the Jewish New Year, the Feast of Trumpets, and this itself has connections with the coronation day of Jewish kings. Wow, that's that's pretty interesting there. I have, I've never heard that. That's really interesting. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really fascinating. So, I mean, <laughs> you can see already, I mean, the parallels are so, you know, stark. Okay. So that does it for point six. Moving on to point seven, this, something about the star suggested birth. Now, it just so happens that after these events that were happening uh, that I just described, nine months later, which just happens to be the human gestation period, okay, we see another event involving Jupiter, the king planet in the sky, and that's a conjunction with the planet Venus, which is commonly understood to be the mother planet. They actually, they form a union or a conjunction, like I said. And what happened there is that they actually formed what was probably the brightest star that anybody had ever seen in the, the night sky at wow. that time. Wow. That is neat how all that comes together. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I was shocked when I first came across this. I couldn't believe it. So moving on to point nine then, the star stopped over the place where the child was. That was, of course, Bethlehem. Now, this was a couple years later. It wasn't actually at his birth. The text it, it seems to indicate that uh, this was after uh, Jesus had grown, probably about two years old at that time. There is a, another uh, event involving Jupiter, and this just happens to fall on December 25th of 2 BC. Mm. And anybody would recognize that as Christmas Day. Okay. Yeah. It, and it's, it's really interesting that, that at that time, that day had different significance. It was actually a Roman festival celebrating the God Soul Invictus or the Unconquered Sun. And uh, anybody who's familiar with uh, Messianic prophecies from the Bible or the Old Testament, even the New Testament, honestly, especially in, in places in Revelation, the sun is a focal point and is very strongly associated with the Messiah. But the event that I'm talking about here that involves Jupiter is Jupiter itself actually stops in the sky to reverse its course in the southern sky just over Bethlehem as viewed from Jerusalem. No way. Is, is there a, Are there any reasons... From your point of view or what you've learned, how, how that could have happened? Any explanations for that? Yeah, yeah. So you're asking, how did the star reverse course, basically? Yeah. Now, Larson does explain this in his documentary, and it's probably one of the more difficult th things to uh, understand here. But uh, this is a phenomenon that's known very well to astronomers, and it's called retrograde motion. And because the planets are moving it, around the sun at different angular speeds than the Earth, it results in some relative positions of the Earth and these planets that caused their apparent movement through the field of fixed stars to temporarily reverse their direction. It's hard to visualize why that would happen. And Dr. Martin's website, askelm.com, actually uh, has a lot of visual resources to help explain what's going on there. But yes, the, it actually, planet Jupiter actually did stop in the sky uh, to begin reversing its course in this phenomenon of retrograde motion. Wow. So if I understand you correctly, because when you first said that, it's like, okay, everything up to this point was kind of like, all right, I see how that could happen. And God put these stars in places and he designed all this. And then, of course, God could, he could do anything. He could reverse the planets. But then that's where you're going to get the skeptics saying, wait a second. But you're saying this is an actual phenomena, correct? Yes, yes. This is, uh, astronomers can explain exactly how this happens. It happens all the time. It's just a matter of, in this case, it happened at a very specific time in a wow. very specific context. Yeah. Wow. Man, well, <laughs> this is one of those things, boy, I, I'd... I'd really like to hear more, but we are just about out of time, guys. And Carmine, I appreciate you introducing us to that. And I will put the link to Larson's uh, video in the uh, uh, show notes too. So encourage everyone if they want to look into this more to, to look into it. I have to say, Carmine, it, everything you give there, just what little you were able to give is sounds plausible. Right. Yeah. Joe, what do you think? Does it sound plausible? And then after that, Take us home. It does. I'm encouraged to click on that link myself and watch the documentary. Just a very quick clarification for our listeners. When Carmine was talking about celestial bodies, that wasn't in reference to, to me. And that might be something people need clarification on. Uh, but <laughs> I think what's, what's amazing to me is that... Is that uh, Carmine. I had to get that joke in there. I just had to get that joke in there. Carmine, I, I apologize for Joe. <laughs> Shaking my head. I'm embarrassed for all of you, but especially Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be taking us home, Darren. All right, take us home. <laughs> so what? what's most amazing to me is... And I've got, to, I've got to digest some of this my, myself and think through it. But the fact that, that God used literally everything in the, in the universe, everything he created to declare 
This is my son. That's that's what's amazing is he uses Amen. even the even the stars and the and the heavens to to declare that and the the timing all works out miraculously. That's just the God we worship and serve, and He is amazing. Can I get an Amen? <laughs> amen, brother. Amen, brother. Thanks, guys. Amen, brothers. <laughs> all right, thanks, folks. See you next time. been listening to the flaming sword until next time remember love the sheep shoot the wolves